Today we're going to talk about uh, still 1D, one dimensional motion, but multi-D, multi-degrees of freedom. So the, 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 the object of interest is going to be this thing, which is just like the air track from last time, but now it has two masses on it. And then I'm going to talk about a solution with MATLAB. Before we start, in order to get your head into the classroom, we start out with a quiz. And the quiz goes like this. We have uh, a fourth harmonic oscillator. And we're given the spring constant and the mass. And we're given the forcing frequency. And we're given the initial conditions. And we'll, somehow there'll be some oscillations of this thing, x of t. And then we look at the amplitude of the oscillations which is we connect the peaks and we can draw a curve, which is the amplitude. So we want to look at the amplitude of oscillation and you're supposed to pick which of these uh, is the right answer or none of them. And I will start a vote now. Any questions about the question? <coughs> questions about the question? What is the question? <laughs> Which of these curves describes the amplitude as a function of time for this problem? OK, let's make it official. You can talk to each other about the answer as well as the question. Go ahead, talk to each other in pairs. Uh, how did you guys vote? 47% uh, for A, 9% for B, 12% for C, 25% for D, and 7% for E. Okay, so the most popular, what I would call wrong answer, was D. And in some sense, this is the right answer. Okay, so what do I mean by right and wrong answers here? Um, I'll show you in a second. Here we have the oscillator. It's an undamped oscillator, and we are forcing it. The resonant frequency of this is the square root of k over m, which is 1, and we're forcing it very close to the resonant frequency. One way you could know the answer is I showed it to you in class last time, and what you saw is when you force it very close to the resonant frequency, it starts out looking like you would expect for resonance. So for resonance, you get just something growing linearly in time. But the frequencies don't quite match. And what you get is that you get this growing oscillation, looks like resonance, and then it decays again, grows, and then decays. How can you understand that? I actually didn't talk about last time. Is that if you take this equation, you can get a homogeneous solution and a particular solution. Because this is an undamped system, the homogeneous solution lasts forever. So usually in vibrations, people neglect the homogeneous solution because it damps out eventually. But if there's no damping, it lasts forever. In order to satisfy these initial conditions with this forcing, what happens is you get a very big homogeneous solution, and you get a very big particular solution, but they're at slightly different frequencies. So they cancel some of the time, and add some of the time, and cancel some of the time, and add some of the time. And this period here is about 100 times the period, corresponding to this 1.01. The initial conditions make them cancel at the beginning, because you have to have sort of nothing going on. And then they get out of phase, in phase, out of phase, in phase. And that's the particular solution and the, and the homogeneous solution interacting. Now, if I went to do this experiment, what's the result I would get <coughs> is this one, or something like this one. Why is that? Because if you do an experiment, there will be a little bit of damping, and in the long run, the homogeneous solution will damp out. Whatever it took to satisfy the initial condition will disappear, and you'll just be left with what it takes to balance these two terms in steady state. So you just have a sine wave with no transient. And in order to balance these two terms, what happens is because this thing is almost the same frequency as this one, this amplitude has to be very big. Okay, so this is, in practical terms, the right answer. This is one 
which you can see in some experiments, and I'll see if I can demonstrate it for you uh, here with this machine. Uh, which is not the single degree of freedom system, but it still, it still will go okay. Okay, so now our goal today, any questions about this? Okay, moving on. Uh, we want to talk about multi-degrees of freedom. This thing has little springs, which are maybe hard for you to see, but here are two masses and three springs. And can you see this, everything? Uh, this is on an air track, so it's very low friction. So the purpose of this system is so that the theory in the experiment will agree very well. It's not to show you the defects in experiments, it's to show you the goodness of the theory. Uh, the theory works very well for this. These are about equal masses and about equal springs. And if you t turn off the friction with the friction on, well, we could study that motion too. It's just kind of boring, but of course it's something you should be able to think about. But if we turn on the motor so the friction goes down, these things interact with these springs and they can move in sort of complicated uh, ways. So let's see if I can... So... So I start them off. They move in these complicated ways. Now the question is, can you understand that motion? So there's two ways we can think about understanding that motion. One way is, can we write the equations, the differential equations? If we can, then at least we can integrate them on the computer, and we can say, oh, we can understand that motion because we can generate it on the computer. So that's one level of understanding. The next level of understanding is, can we write the solution with sines and cosines or exponentials and things like that? And that's another level of understanding. The first one is more important to me as your teacher in this class, but the second one is more important to other people for some more advanced classes. So we'll, do, we'll talk about a little bit of both, but mostly the first. So what we'd like to do is be able to write the differential equations, solve them at least on the computer, and then we'll notice there's some cute things about the solutions, and then we say, can we use those cute things in order to figure out some analytic pencil paper solution? Did it look like a sine wave? Yes, no? Did you, you remember what it was looking like? Did it look like a sine wave? Wait, what? Let's just try it. So it's going back and forth, but I wouldn't say it looks like a sine wave, especially if we're going to say this is, you could say it's sort of like a sine wave, but it's doing a jiggly thing. So what kind of function does a jiggly thing like that? Does anybody know the answer to this question? Has anybody been through this example before? You want to make a guess about what the solution is? Anybody? What function of time are we dealing with if we're, say, watching one of these masses? So the claim is we can write this with pencil and paper if we, if we go through the exercise. What function of time sort of looks like that? Some kind of a Fourier series? Yes. A special kind of a Fourier series. One that's only got two terms in it. So it's the sum of two sine waves. So both of these motions are the sum of, of uh, two sine waves. <coughs> okay, so let's start out with this example. And we're going to do this as a 1D example, and it's three springs and two masses. So we can draw the two masses, and we can connect them with springs. And not only that, one of the springs can be connected to a a, a scotch yoke, which is going round and round, so it's connected to a uh, this scotch yoke device, which is spin which is uh, which is spinning in circles, so that this thing spins round and round. So I'll call this I'll call I'll call 
this the reference point. We're going to measure along in this direction. We're going to get over to this wall over here. And then we have to keep track of uh, positions of things uh, along this length. So maybe the length of this rod here is D. That's that little connecting rod. So the position of this uh, oscillating base here, we can call X0. And X0 is going to be the oscillation is going to be, well, the way I've set this up, it's going to be D cosine some forcing function of time. That's the motion of this point due to this motor, which is spinning around uh, with angular speed, uh, so that the angle that the motor makes is omega t. So this point is going round and round. This thing is stuck in a little track like this. So this point moves in circles, and this thing goes back and forth sinusoidally. So that's our forcing, and that little forcing mechanism we have built into this motor here, which I did not turn on for you yet. Okay, well we've got these various springs. Say here's K1, which has rest length L1. Maybe I should put L01, K2, L02, K3, L03. Uh, these things could have some widths, say W1 and W2. And this whole thing has a length all the way across, which is, say, L. And here we have M1 and M2. Okay, is the situation clear? Now, for completeness, just so that you're lined up for doing the homework, I'm going to add something which is not in the actual machine, but let me just put it here, and I'll just call this C2, which is a dash pot. Let's assume that between these two things, there's some uh, friction. There's a, there's a connection between with the dash pot, which is like a shock absorber or something like that, like the kind of thing you see in some doors, like screen doors and so on. Okay, any question about the setup or the problem? Yes? The, the picture of this, of this motor is like this. It's, it's got this piece which is spinning around like this. It's D like this. There's this little slot which is going around like so. And here's this theta which is oscillating this uh, motor around in, t in time like that. Does that answer your question? Any other questions? Who had that same question or did not know that before she asked? Okay, about 15 people, so just for future reference, if you have a question, there's a high probability that other people wish you would ask it. Any other questions? Okay, so now what we want to do to get the equations of motion is draw free body diagrams. How many free body diagrams could we reasonably draw for this problem? Well, this, the natural thing to say is two. We could draw one of this mass and one of this mass. But we could also draw the system consisting of these two masses. That would be three. Who said three out loud? Somebody said, is that what you had in mind? But you could also draw a free body diagram of this spring, or of this spring, or this dash pot, or this spring, or this mass with this spring or this spring and this mass and this spring and this dash pot, you can draw a free body diagram of any part of the system you're interested in. For each free body diagram, you get to apply the laws of mechanics. In this case, we've got two degrees of freedom. We're going to want two differential equations. So we'll get one differential equation from each free body diagram of anything with mass. The things we draw free body diagrams of that don't have mass, we just solve as statics problems. And if those statics problems are so easy, we solve them in our heads. For example, when you pull on a spring, there's a force on one end of the spring and a force on the other end, and they have to add to zero so they have the same magnitude. And we do that one in our heads. So usually you don't draw free body diagrams of the, of the components whose mass you think is negligible. 
So for example, for these springs, they're much lighter than these masses, and we don't worry about the dynamics of these springs. We think of them as effectively in static equilibrium. Now they're moving, so there is MA, but we, think, but we imagine without doing a detailed calculation that the forces at the two ends, the difference between the two of them that's needed to accelerate this mass is so small that we can neglect it. Is that clear? Okay, so now we want to draw these free body diagrams. And it's trickier than you think. So even though you think you can do it, most of you will get, would, get, would get this problem wrong if I just gave it to you as a homework problem this minute. So I want to help you out here, yes? How exactly does a dash pot work? Now there are various ways of answering that question. So one way is, is, is a picture that looks like this, where we put a tension, when we cut it free, there's a tension like this. We measure the length of the dash pot from here to here, and we say that the tension is equal to some constant times L dot. So when we say how exactly does a dash pot work, in terms of homework problems and idealizations, this is how a dash pot works. If you want to say, how does a dash pot work, as in, it's a machine, how does it function? The ideal picture of a dash pot is that it's a piston. And it's sliding inside a thing like this. This piece is like so. And this is connected over here like so. And in here, there's a fluid and the fluid can leak a little bit over here, so the fluid's on this side too. So coming over here, there's a seal which holds in the fluid. And this gushes back and forth, and the fluid runs back and forth in here. And it's the viscous resistance of the fluid which resists the motion of the dash pot. So that's how it works. Now, when you actually buy a thing which looks kind of like this, the air is compressible, so it acts a little bit like a spring. The drag is maybe quadratic. There's a rubbing on the side, so there's a dry friction term. But this is the idealization of what it is. It's a viscous resistance to motion of a, some plunger thing like this. And I don't know, the word dash pot, I always think this is the dash and this is the pot, but I have no idea if that's right or not. Okay, who asked the question? I don't know, which of these was your actual question? This one or this one? Okay. Any questions remaining? Okay. Okay, so let's, let's start out by looking at mass one. And then we're also going to draw a free body diagram of mass two. So here's mass one. And we are going to then cut it free of its environment and make it be fooled into thinking the environment is still there. So we go over here, and there's a spring, and we cut it free of the spring, and what do we show? The force of the spring on the thing. Now is the spring pushing to the right or to the left? Okay, let me ask you a different question. Do I have a positive balance in my bank account? Or am I in debt and I owe money in my bank account? You don't know. You don't know what kind of guy I am, right? And you don't know the nature of this spring. You don't know if this spring is over here, squished like that, or if this spring is over here like that. In fact, it might sometimes be over here and sometimes over here. Just like you don't know my bank account. But you want to keep track of it. So you have to make a sign convention, and the sign convention for all time for you in this class, and I recommend it for the rest of your lives, is that when things are pulling away, it's positive. Tension is positive. That doesn't mean that the spring is in tension. It might be that that tension has a negative value, just like the balance of my account might have a negative value, but you say, how much money do you have? Let's take, use the power of, negatives to, of negative numbers to say I have $1,000 or negative $1,000. Okay, so without knowing whether that tension, whether it's actually in compression or not, 
we say it is in tension. And I'll call this T1. Then I come over here. Do I know if this is in tension or not? I do not. So I'll call this T2. And this is T2S. And I've got to cut this dash pot here. And this is T2 of the dash pot. Then I draw the second mass. And I use the same rule. It looks like it might be bumping up against that wall, but I'm not going to worry about it. I'm going to assume it's in tension. So I have T3. And then I have over here uh, two forces. And now I get to use my free body diagrams of the middle springs here and the middle dash pot. And from those free body diagrams, I know that T2S is equal to T2S. I don't even invent separate letters for it. And I have T2 dash pot is equal to T2 dash pot. And I show my little cut marks here to show that I've gone up with a chainsaw and isolated these things. So here's two more free body diagrams. <coughs> Usually you don't bother to draw them, but if you're confused, draw them. And you see the action and reaction. And then this same scalar, the tension of the spring, appears four places, both ends of the spring and at both things that it acts on. So here's this T2S and T2 dash pi. Okay, so these are the free body diagrams, and they're pretty complete, just the way they are. Any questions about those free body diagrams? Now I have to figure out what those tensions are in terms of other things. So our crystal ball, we want to predict the future. We want to know how this thing's going to move if we know where it is. So the question is, if we know where the masses are, are you bored? You look bored. <laughs> now anybody who's bored, just write ahead. Just do the lecture ahead and then see if you can stay ahead of me. Okay. Where were we? Crystal balls. We're trying to predict the future. How do we predict the future is we pretend we know the current state. In mechanics, the current state is where everything is and how fast everything is moving. And we're going to predict the future by knowing the laws of mechanics and kinematics. One of the laws is we know how fast things are moving. That tells you how fast they're changing, like x dot is equal to v. And the other one is if we know the positions and the velocities from the constitutive laws, the material properties of the things, like the springs and dash pots, we can calculate the forces. If we know the forces, we can calculate the accelerations. Therefore, we can calculate the rate of change of the velocities. And therefore, we have differential equations we can write and try and solve one way or another. So now what we want to do is say we pretend we know the state of the system. So we pretend we know what the present value of x and v are, which we don't, right? We haven't solved it yet. But if we pretend what we know what they are, we can write down what the forces are, write the differential equations, then we can go back and solve the differential equations and find out what x and v are as functions of time. So we pretend we know x and v at this point to move forward. So we're pretending that we know x and v. We want to figure out what these things are. So let me just make that explicit. We pretend we know x and v at t. Okay, so this is an important sort of psychological trick in how you write uh, differential equations. It's actually a good psychological trick even for other courses. How do you solve problems? You pretend you know things that you don't. You write down true things about those things you don't know and see if that gives you a set of equations you can solve. In this case, we pretend we know position, velocity, and time. We'll write equations, differential equations, and we'll si solve them to find position, velocity, at time t. Okay, so if we know these things, Let's start out with the first one. What is the tension in spring one? Well, it's k times the stretch in spring one. So it's the same way we pick a sign convention that pulling away, tension is always positive. We take the sign convention that getting longer is always positive. We don't know if the spring's getting longer or shorter. Just say getting longer is positive. Once and for all, Clear it out of your heads. It will save you lots of trouble and lots of problems if you just believe me. Everything is positive. The power of positive thinking. Let me just put a quick caveat on that. Is anybody here majoring in geology? Civil engineering? Okay. 
if you're going to be dealing with the underground part of civil engineering, you, you can forget what I just said. Because if, if everything is negative all the time, you get sick of it, so you want to stick with the power of positive thinking and say negative is positive. So if you're working on stuff under the ground, then compression is positive. But most of us are not. Okay, so, this, okay. <laughs> okay, so now we have uh, times this change in length. So now we want to say, what is this change in length? One way to think about that is it's the present length minus the rest length. Now we want to fill in these things. So we have the spring constant. In this case, this is the spring constant 1 times the change in length 1, spring constant 1, L1 minus L10. And then what is L1? Well, it's the position of that first mass minus the position of x0. But x0, remember, we have is d uh, cosine omega t in this, in this uh, way of setting things up. And then we have minus the rest length is L10. So now we can write this whole thing as k times x1 minus d sine omega t minus L10. And that's what T1 is. What? Cosine. Any questions about that? Okay, what's T2S? Can you read here in the shadow? Is, that clear? Is the shadow okay for writing there? Okay, what's T2S? It's equal to uh, K2 times uh, the length of spring 2 minus the length of spring 2, 0. But what is that length of that spring? Now we have to be careful. So when we mark out these distances, we're going to mark out the distance and we have to pick some point of interest. I'll pick this point here and call that x1. And then I go over here and I pick some point of interest and I'll call this x2, which represents the motion of these things. Okay, so we have what's the length of that spring minus the L20. So the L20 power is going to be easy. What's the length is this x2 minus the position of the other end of the spring, which was x1 plus this thing, which I called over here w1. So that's the length of spring 2. And then we subtract L20 from that. OK, then we get to T2 dash pot. And that's this constant. I call it C2 times L2 dot, which is going to be C2 times the rate of change of this length. And that is x2 dot minus x1 dot. And the w doesn't come in because the w, the width of the block, is a constant. And then finally, we have T3. Uh, T3 is equal to what? Why don't you guys write this down yourself? And then um, see if you agree with me. You can talk to your friend if you're confused about it. Or you can ask me a question about anything else. You have a whole minute to write down T3. Yes? The question is, why am, why am I making this so confusing, in other words? So a usual way that people would write problems like this is they would measure things from a reference position. And they would say, let's look at how far this has moved from a reference position. Why am I not doing that? Is that your question? The reason I'm not doing that is because I'm pretending that I'm not just a 
physicist doing some ideal question, but I'm an engineer, and I have an actual spring which has an actual length, and an actual block which has an actual size, and I want to actually know where these things are. So for example, in this problem, when I turn this on, if I gave you all those lengths, and I said, where, relative to this end, are these things, when this thing is still, can you tell me, in terms of those parameters, the position of this point and this point? You can't. You say, oh, it's this rest length, plus this width, plus this rest length, that's where this point is, but no, it's not. Because plus this width, plus this rest length, maybe doesn't add up to the total length of this machine. And in fact, it doesn't, because these springs are pre-stretched. These springs are not in a relaxed configuration the way I have it here. This is the rest length. All these springs are in some tension. So in this problem, even to figure out where these things want to be sitting still, even where the rest position is, that's a calculation. If you want to set up that calculation, it's a straight problem from TAM 2020, and you have to solve two equations and two unknowns to solve that. If all I wanted to know was the vibrational aspects of these things, I could say, let's just measure relative to some reference position, and when I write the spring tensions, I won't really mean the spring tensions. I'll mean how much the tensions change relative to that position. And then I could do what you're saying. And it turns out I get the right answer for the vibrations because all these differential equations are linear. But if I don't know that ahead of time, I really want to know how this moves. I want to take account the fact that these springs are not relaxed at the initial position. I've got to do this whole complicated thing like this. Okay. So in answer to your question, how come I'm making this so confusing? is because in some real problem like this, I have no choice. Does that address your question? Does everybody understand your question and my answer? OK, so now you're working on a puzzle problem. Who is done with the puzzle problem? Who's not done? Who's not trying? OK, one minute more. Do you remember the puzzle problem? is to put the stuff that goes on the other side of these two horizontal lines. Yes, what's your question? Say again. Yes. This one here? How come I didn't how come I didn't bring a W one down here? Because that, that piece of red down there, that red thing is made out of hard aluminum. And I'm imagining that even though the metal thing made out of steel is stretching next to it, I'm thinking that that aluminum thing doesn't stretch very much, and then its length is constant in time. So when I take the time derivative, it's zero. Even though part is steel and part is aluminum, I'm thinking the steel part is changing length, the aluminum part is not. Right? Because the aluminum part has a big cross-sectional area and stretching, and the and the steel one is very thin as it's in bending and torsion, and so it deforms more. Yes? Is that clear what I just said? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so what is this T3? Now we're going to have an honor system about whether you got it right or not. It's the spring constant, K3, multiplied by the length of spring 3 minus uh, the rest length of spring 3, 3, 0. Okay, so what is the length of spring 3? So that's K3 times the length of spring 3. Well, on the right side we have L, and when we subtract from that the position of the right side of that mass, 
which is x2 plus w2. This whole collection of things is the length of the spring. That's L3. And then we have to subtract from that L30. OK. Little honor system here. How many people got that right? Raise your hands. OK, I won't even do the other one. OK, very good. Any questions about this? <coughs> OK, now we go to get uh, our, our crystal ball. We have free body diagrams. We've used the geometry pretty much. We haven't used the kinematics, the fact that x dot equals v, but that's easy. Now we're going to use the laws of mechanics, which we call linear momentum balance. It's a horrible name for it because it's about rate of change of linear momentum. But the whole idea is something about linear momentum or its rate of change has to balance something like forces. You can think of this as the dynamic version of F equals MA. Sum of forces, which used to be zero in statics, is not zero over here. So for mass one, we say that the sum of forces acting on this is equal to the mass times the acceleration. What is the sum of forces on mass one? It's T2 from the spring with a plus is T2 from the dash pot with a plus is minus what I call T1. Why do I get this minus T1? I multiply T1 by a unit vector in the direction this is pointing, which is in the negative I direction. And then this is equal to M1 X1 double dot. And then I can substitute in all the things here. Um, sub in from the constitutive laws. And then this whole thing turns into a bunch of stuff with x's. What does it turn into? It turns into uh, something times x, something times x dot, plus a bunch of constants and so on. Then I have mass 2. And for mass 2, I'm going to write that the sum of forces is equal to the mass times acceleration. And what are the sum of forces on this thing? It's a T3 to the right minus a 2T 2D minus a uh, T2S. And this is equal to mass 2X2 double dot. And then I can do the same substitutions in here. Now, if I'm going to try to get a pencil and paper solution, I want to do those substitutions. If I'm going to do this on the computer, I don't even want to write these substitutions, because on the computer, when I do the calculation, I can write these things in one line of code and write those in another line of code, and I never have to have this blow up of algebraic complexity. I never see it because the computer just does the arithmetic again and again. OK, so now my goal was to set this up on the computer. I think I'm going to start, I'm just going to do it on the blackboard today, the starting of that setup, so you can see how it goes. Uh, and, then I'll, and then I'll start right in uh, next class and doing it on the computer. Let me ask you a question before we get to solving these uh, equations. What would happen if instead of drawing the free body diagram I drew, I drew a free body diagram of the two masses? The free body of the two masses looks like this. And those forces in the middle don't show, because in free body diagrams, you don't show internal forces. When I took the system in that picture, 
and cut it free from the world, I cut that spring and I have to fool, and I cut that spring and I have to fool, and I didn't cut these so I don't have to do any fooling. I could write linear momentum balance for this system, which says that the sum of the forces is equal to the rate of change of the linear momentum. If you have a collection of forces, the rate of change of linear momentum is just the sum of the rates of change of the parts. So linear momentum for a system is additive, as is the rate of change. Well, what I'd have here in my differential equation is I'd have minus T1 plus T3 is equal to M1 X1 double dot plus M2 X2 double dot. Is that a new independent equation or not? Okay, one person knows. Who has an opinion on this subject? Not is it or isn't it? Do you have an opinion on whether this is a new independent equation or is not a new independent equation? You have an opinion? Raise your hand. You do not have an opinion? Raise your hand. Okay, so those of you who have an opinion, all those in favor of this is a new equation, all those in favor that it's not a new equation. Okay, it's not a new equation. That means I should be able to find it from the other equations that are on the blackboard. Can somebody tell me how to find this equation from other equations on the blackboard? Yes? That is correct. So I take this equation and add it to this equation, and I get that one. In the same way that I got one free body diagram and the other free body diagram and put them together, I get the net free body diagram. This is an additive property of free body diagrams. This is why, even though you can draw lots of free body diagrams, all you have to draw is free body diagrams of the parts. Sometimes it helps, like with truss problems, remember it helped to draw a free body diagram of the whole truss, but you never had to do that. If you just drew free body diagrams of each of the joints, that would work. <coughs> okay, so I'm, I'm way out of order on the blackboards, but I hope you can follow it. <coughs> So now we want to organize these, these equations for computer solution. I bet I have an answer to. What's your question? Yes. Right. So a side calculation here is L of that dash pot is equal to its rest length. What's the rest length of a dash pot? It's not a spring, it's a dash pot. It's just a gooey fluid thing. So there's not, the concept of the rest length isn't even in the dash pot. So what you do is look at the length, which has in it the W2, or W1 just like this one does. So here was the length of the spring 2. And then we take the derivative of that in time. But that width we said is constant. Remember that whole speech I gave about the aluminum and the steel and the springs and so on? That was just a distraction. It's just a block. It's got a fixed width. Its length is constant. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Okay, we want to set this up for a computer solution. So what we have is that we can calculate uh, T1 is equal to something or other. We know this. T2 uh, spring equals something. We know this. Uh, T2 dash pot, something we know this. T3, we know this. What do we mean we know this? Is these are known in terms of uh, the positions, the velocities, I'll just call this V1, V2, and time, and parameters. So that's the first thing we can calculate. Then we can use our differential equations 
what do they say? They say that x1 dot is equal to v1. That's trivial. That's like fifth grade or something. Then we have v1 dot is equal to what we got from f equals ma, which was uh, this t to s uh, plus t to dash pot minus t1 divided by m. Then we have x2 dot is equal to v2. And then we have v2 dot is equal to uh, the stuff from here, which was t3 minus t2s minus t2d, all divided by m2. So now we have our differential equations. What we'd like to do now to make it so that we can do harder and harder problems without it making more and more confusing in MATLAB is we'll define four numbers and call them z. So we'll think of a vector in MATLAB. In, in MATLAB, a vector is just a list of numbers. z1, z2, z3, z4. And we'll think of this list of numbers as being um, x1, x2, v1, and v2. So these differential equations, star, a different way to think about these the equations, star, is that, they're, that the rate of change of z is equal to some function of z and um, t and parameters. What is this function? Is f equals ma and uh, x dot equals v. So our differential equations, all of them came from these two ideas, f equals ma and x dot equals v. There are these four equations. Abstractly, what they are is the rate of change of four numbers depends on four numbers and time and parameters. So this is our general form for differential equations. This is our general form for the crystal ball all kinds of complicated systems, you just think, oh, the state, z, and the time, and the constants of the system tell me the future because I know the rate of change and I can march forward like this. So this idea that we have with, say, exponential growth, if we know the value, we know it grows proportional to time, we have z dot equals z, so we can sort of predict this exponential growth, that idea applies for all dynamical systems. So this is a general form we have for dynamical systems in mechanics and otherwise. And this is the form that we like to line things up for our computer solution. Okay, so I'll just start class next time with that. Any quick questions? Okay.